Hey, good morning, members. I'm going to call Human Services Finance and Policy to order. Ms. Hansen, can you please take the roll? Schultz is present. Chair Schultz present. Vice Chair Bonner? Present. Representative Albright? Representative Bolden? Present. Representative Burkle? Burkle present. Thank you. Representative Fisher? Fisher present. Repre oh, Representative Frederick isn't with us yet. Representative Hansen? Representative Keel? Present. Representative Liebling? Present. Representative Moeller? Present. Representative Noor? Present. Representative Novotny? Present. Representative Pearson? Pearson present. Representative Pinto? Representative Rasmussen? Rasmussen present. Representative Robbins? Present. Representative Sandell? Present. And Representative Schumacher? Schumacher present. And I see Lead Albright just joined us. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Members, we have a quorum. Representative Albright, would you like to move the minutes from March 29th? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any corrections or comments on the minutes? Not seeing any members, please unmute yourself for a voice vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes from March 29th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the minutes are approved. The first bill on our agenda members is House File 34. Zero four, and this is Representative Morrison's bill. Welcome to the committee, Representative Morrison. Let's see if she's on. Hold on one second. Sorry, members, I don't see. Um... Okay, she's on. Sorry, members, for the delay. Representative Morrison, we are on your bill, House File 3404. And I still don't see her logging in. Okay, she's having issues with the link. I think I'm gonna to go to the next bill. House file 4588. We have Representative Ryer with us. Representative Ryer, are you ready to present your bill? I believe she might also be doing double duty in another committee. Okay. I'm gonna just <laughs> I'm going to take a recess for two minutes. Just hold on, everyone. Stay hooked on Here, to. Um, here's Representative Ryan, uh, Morrison. Okay, thank you, Representative Morrison. We are on your bill. Let's file 3404. And I see that you have um, an amendment. Is that correct? The A1 amendment? That's correct, Madam Chair. Can you tell us a little bit about the amendment and then we'll adopt it? I apologize for my tardy arrival, Madam Chair. I'm having connectivity issues. Uh, yes, the A1 uh, amendment adds DHS preferred language and establishes a more flexible weekly per diem um, for the ITFC and it aligns implementation dates and language with DHS work plans. Okay, everyone, I'm gonna move the A1 amendment to House File 3404. Members, this is a voice vote. Please unmute yourself. All those in favor of adopting the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the AU1 amendment to House File 3404 is adopted. I'm going to move to lay over House File 3404 as amended for possible inclusion in our Human Services Omnibus Bill. Representative Morrison, to your bill as amended. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members, and thank you for the opportunity to present House File 3404. House File 3404 builds Minnesota's family-centered, community-based models to serve children with intensive mental health needs who could otherwise require residential care. The service models in this bill have demonstrated effectiveness in delivering clinical care while supporting the family system with child's treatment for their mental illness. We know that too many of our children are experiencing mental illness without needed care, boarding in our hospital emergency departments on six month waiting lists for residential mental health treatment or worse, accessing no care at all. At this critical juncture, we must bring forward the resources and resolve to build what is needed and develop a full continuum to meet child and family needs. This bill builds on what works with substantive research on effectiveness driving each model forward. The goal of House File 3404 is to increase access to each of these models for children experiencing acute mental illness to access to care with the support of their families. Specifically, the bill reflects the governor's language to expand access to the intensive treatment and foster care model to all families whose child demonstrates the level of care, the level of need for this care model. It creates a path forward for collaborative intensive bridging services and high fidelity wraparound to sustain infrastructure built by federal grant funding and to pursue future Medicaid funding for these benefits. It includes therapeutic services model developed between intermediate school districts and community providers to deliver care to some of our most vulnerable children and families. The legislation continues to build on the evidence base developed to, to date to position these practices for federal sustained funding. funding. House File 3404 is the product of collaboration between county, provider, and DHS experts. Please note the many voices of support included in your virtual packet today. You'll see in these letters the impacts of the care models in House File 3404, delivering family-centered care with the treatment needed to improve the well-being of the child and the family. And Madam Chair, I do have several testifiers, and I believe my first is Trevor Johnson from Lutheran Social Services in Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Morris. And I'm going to go to the testifiers now. We do have uh, Trevor Johnson. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and your affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Chair Schultz, members of the committee. My name is Trevor Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Behavioral Health Services at Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota, where I lead our efforts to offer access to mental health and wellness services to children, youth, adults, and families across the state of Minnesota. In my 17 years working in the behavioral health field, I've come across many gaps in the continuum of services and the need for intensive in-home family focused services across the state. And it's that need has never been greater than it is today. Children with mental health disorders can find it hard to manage strong emotions, may be highly impulsive, can find change and transition challenging, or may have unresolved trauma that masquerades as aggression, reactivity, or shutting down. These symptoms and behaviors can be very severe and greatly impair their ability to function in school, in the community, while presenting significant challenges to their families and caregivers. All too often, parents and caregivers are blamed and shamed for their child's behavior, even though they themselves are challenged just as much, if not more, at home. Concerns about a child's safety and the safety of other family members can develop quickly when aggressive, impulsive, self-injurious, or oppositional behaviors escalate, especially for families who are already incredibly stressed, exhausted, and under-supported. Many, many families face these challenges prior to the pandemic, and we continue to hear from parents and caregivers who say that things have only gotten worse over the last two years due to inconsistent access to supportive services and disruptions in care. In addition, at LSS, we have seen an increase in service requests from families, from, from county social workers, and from school staff for children who are presenting with new and previously unexperienced, unexperienced mental health symptoms. We see the services in House File 3404 making a meaningful difference in and with, with the lives of children and their families. This bill will expand intensive treatment and foster care, also known as ITFC, to all eligible families. In ITFC, trauma-focused services are provided to children from birth to age 20 who are identified with a need for intensive services that go well above and beyond other community-based models. A mental health professional works with the child, family, parents, and other caregivers for six or more hours a week. And through a combination of individual and family therapy, psychoeducation about mental illness, and impacts of trauma, crisis assistance, and clinical care consultation with other providers, teachers, daycare providers, et cetera. 
as well as others to achieve identified treatment goals and promote sustained mental health outcomes. Expanding the service for children with intensive service needs outside of a foster care setting will provide an option for families who have had to rely on more intensive, <coughs> excuse me, and more expensive services in the past. Collaborative Intensive Bridging Services, or SIBS, serves children eight to 17 and their families when other community-based services have not been able to meet the child's safety and mental health needs. SIBS offers intensive in-home therapy options coupled with an intensive short-term residential stay. The service creates a bridge into residential services and back into the home. During the residential stay, the family and child continue to receive therapy services with the same provider and are offered opportunities to practice the skills learned in treatment during frequent home visits. SIBS has developed originally or was developed originally in Dakota County is now offered in 16 counties. High Fidelity Wraparound uses an evidence-based and person-centered model, <clears throat> pardon me, focused on coordinating and planning care in partnership with children and families to improve the outcomes for children who are at risk of out-of-home placement and are served across multiple agencies and providers. The service identifies and builds on strengths of the family to establish mutually agreed upon goals and objectives that the family and all providers and agencies involved can work on collectively over time. Providing funding to continue this work and set up a pathway for sustainable funding for these proven services of meeting the needs of children and families is essential. Without this, many children and families will lose access to these critical services and increase the demand for more intensive and expensive services. And if I could, I'd like to just share uh, one family that was referred to us for intensive treatment services after repeated calls to the police and social services when their child was extremely agitated, would run outside, scream, throw things, causing property damage to neighbors' homes and refuse to go back inside even if it was 40 below outside and they were only in a t-shirt. By coming into their home, by creating a comprehensive, completing a comprehensive assessment, providing education about anxiety and the effects of trauma, working with the family on skills and ways to respond in their own environment, consulting with other providers, county staff and other caregivers, and providing evidence-based trauma treatment that involved the child and the family, everyone started to notice a change. One day, an event occurred that in the past would have led to some of the most concerning of behaviors. The parent responded with one of the new strategies they'd been working on with the child's mental health therapist, and rather than escalating, the child looked at their parent and said, I think I need to hug it out, and gave their caregiver one of the biggest hugs they'd ever had, and quickly calmed down. Finding ways for parents to be closely involved, supportive, and engaged in services for their child can lead to powerful outcomes like this, but we need to make sure that these types of proven intensive and family-based services remain available and are fully supported. I would like to thank Representative Morrison for authoring this bill and to thank you, Chair Schultz and the committee for providing the opportunity to briefly share the profound impact on children and families that could come from supporting continued access to these services. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for your testimony. And members, the next testifier I have is Leslie Yunker. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and your affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. My name is Leslie Yunker. I'm a supervisor in children's mental health and truancy in Dakota County. I have been a professional in the child welfare and children's mental health system for over 30 years. I would like to speak from the perspective of the role that counties play in the supporting of an array of services for youth and their families. In spite of significant challenges and often competing demands, Minnesota counties are committed to sustaining the investments in the mental health service infrastructure, and they are committed to their contribution in making these key services available to their county residents. Counties play a vital role in the identification and coordination of mental health services with youth and their families. County staff are often on the front lines of hearing from parents and guardians about their courageous struggles in attempting to find access and appropriate care for their children. Over the last years, we have witnessed the crumbling of the mental health system. That This mental health system was developed with the intent to provide a continuum of easily accessible services. It has always been a shared goal amongst counties, providers, and the state to provide this full continuum of services from youth, for youth and their families, a continuum from prevention to early intervention to intensive interventions. Progress towards reaching this goal has become increasingly challenging. 
I have never experienced a time where there has been a greater need for coordinated, intensive community-based care for youth and their families, or a greater opportunity to make significant strides in providing that care. Collaborative intensive bridging services, high fidelity wraparound services, and the expansion of access to the intensive treatment and foster care model are important options for families to access in support of treatment for their children's mental health needs. House File 3404 is a request for bridge funding to sustain this vital work that was begun during the system of care grant application process. All three of these options for care identified in House File 3404 are research-driven, evidence-based models that are supported by counties. But most importantly, these are options that have already begun to be implemented and tested in a variety of counties and regions in Minnesota, and they are making a big difference in the lives of youth and families. No one service or model will ever meet the needs of every youth and family. It is important that multiple models of service are available to meet the unique needs of youth and their families. Youth and family voice are critical to the decision-making regarding their care. House File 3404 offers these options. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Thank you, Ms. Yunker, for being with our committee today and sharing that. The last testifier I have is Jill Burr. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Um, I'm Jill Burr and mom and family that has actually gone through the bridging program. So I'm just gonna- Ms. Burr, can you speak up a little bit louder? Oh, yeah, maybe if I move closer. Um, Joe you. Burr, um, parent and family that in encountered and went through the bridging program. Is that better? Okay, so uh, my husband, Chris, and I have been married for 31 years. We have five children, one which has struggled with a mood disorder since she was two. She's now 20. Her mood disorder has created insane chaos for her and our family. Here are the cliff notes. The first time I took Mary to the ER was suicidal ideations. She was in ninth grade. It was 2016. Over the next four years, we would go back to that ER over 10 times. She would be admitted to the adolescent psych ward seven of those times for stays from a few days to almost two weeks. From the psych ward, sometimes Mary would come home and head back to school. Twice she transitioned from the psych ward to a day treatment program, and twice she went to a residential treatment facility. Mary has also been in several DBT programs. After each treatment, Mary would be great for about a month and then crash. The professionals seemed surprised. We didn't know what to do. A social worker that recommended the SIBS program entered our lives when we were requesting a third residential stay for Mary. What else could we do? We had tried everything and Mary was still not able to function in our family. The calls to the police for violent behavior were escalating. The day, um, the care that we had for Mary up to this point was not consistent. Every time she was admitted to a hospital, day treatment, or residential facility, a new team of social workers, therapists, etc., was created. Once she was discharged, we had to start over and create a new team of help. What impressed us about the SIBS program is that it had many phases and one consistent therapist and social worker that followed Mary and her family through the phases. I believe this team approach from therapy to residential to more therapy helped to solidify the care received. This was also the first family therapy where Mary's siblings were involved. From the beginning, we were offered family therapy. However, that meant um, Chris and me and Mary. We are a tight family and Mary's behavior was scary and disruptive for all of us. Our SIBS therapist agreed that family therapy should, be include, should include the siblings, and that was helpful for our entire family. Because we were given consistent guidance as a family over many phases of treatment, we were given the opportunity to learn and use and practice what was learned in therapy. Our family is grateful for the SIBS program and believe it catapulted us to healing much faster than the mishmash approach of therapy that we and Mary encountered for so many years. So as an update, Mary is now graduated from high school. She's living on her own in her own apartment. I'm gonna cry, but um, um, she has a job and we enjoy her again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Burr, for coming to our committee and sharing your story. Okay, members, any questions for the bill author? We also have available Chris Bray um, and Amy Ward uh, from 
the therapeutic services model. So if you have questions, they are on board to answer them. No questions, members? Okay, any final comments, Representative Morrison? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present House File 3404. This will make great strides to meet the needs of children and families who need intensive treatment services. Very grateful for your consideration. Thank you, Representative Morrison. And with that, members, House File 3404, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion in our human services omnibus bill. Okay, next up, we have House File 4588. Representative Breyer, welcome back to the committee. Good to see you. I see you have an A1 amendment. Do you want to quickly describe that? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, the uh, A1 and amendment. Please, Representative Breyer, can you get, move closer or speak louder? Oh, sure. Is that better? That's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. The A1 amendment uh, does two things. Uh, it um, provides some additional flexibility to uh, counties and tribes for services that can be provided. And it also, you look perplexed, are you still not hearing me? I just turning up my volume, members may need to do that, but please proceed, Representative Breyer. Okay, um, so the, the one is to provide more flexibility. The second is to um, limit the budget flexibility on the part of the state to make uh, changes to allocations. Okay, thank you, Representative Ryer. So I'm going to move the A1 amendment to House File 4588. Members, this is a voice vote. Please unmute yourself. All those in favor of um, adopting the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you, members. The motion is approved and the A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Ryer, please describe your bill as amended. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I have also turned my microphone up to Max, so hopefully that's going to help. Um, so I'm here today to talk about House File 4588, which proposes a variety of structural changes to the Adult Mental Health Initiative Program. Specifically, I'm proposing that we provide stability by defining AMHIs as mental health infrastructure rather than as pilot program that we provide some additional flexibility to accommodate existing needs, as I mentioned in the A1 amendment, and that we fund to a level that matches the needs of the community. I'll discuss each of these in more detail as we proceed. As background, adult mental health initiatives or AMHIs are regional organizations that oversee adult mental health services and funding to counties and tribal governments in their area. They were developed in 1995 as a pilot. The state operated facilities were closing and more staff and resources were being put into community-based settings for individuals who had been served by state hospitals. AMHIs serve as a mechanism for regional collaboration to build effective community-based mental health services across Minnesota and have become essential mental health infrastructure. There are currently 19 mental health initiative regions, and additionally, White Earth Nation is a standalone AMHI region. Uh, now for the three aspects of uh, this bill. First, the program needs stability. You'll note that AMHIs have been a pilot since 1995. This is not a stable position for a program that has truly become essential mental health infrastructure. This bill provides the stronger statutory position the AMHI program warrants. Second, we need to support program flexibility. By design, AMHIs are regional structures that are adapted to local needs. Since they were created, AMHIs have been creating sustainable mental health services that reflect each region's needs, meaning that services don't look the same across the state. Um, as you heard briefly, the A1 amendment reinforces this by allowing some flexibility to provide services as communities' needs change. For example, filling gaps in services not reimbursable by Medicaid or Medicare, but that are essential for sustaining services. Current limitations inhibit the ability for AMHIs to do more upstream and preventive work that includes individuals struggling with serious mental illnesses. The A1 amendment also limits state authority to unilaterally restructure funding within the AMI program 
thereby ensuring that local voices remain at the center of the conversation about this essential community resource. Finally, the program needs adequate funding. Base amounts have been relatively stagnant despite increasing needs and over the years have even been repurposed in times of budget shortfalls. We've seen our already high levels of mental health needs exacerbated by the pandemic. And while we added a one-time bump to funding levels in the 2021 budget, investment falls far, far short of the need. It's time to talk about funding the need. It's time to look at how as a state, we take care of Minnesotans with mental illness and honor the promise to provide community-based service back when this pilot started. These are needs that affect all of us. Virtually every Minnesota family, including mine, is touched by the mental health crisis. Let's look hard at what we can do. We have options, starting with a hold harmless option for counties that is based on the proposed DHS formula revision that would reduce funding to many Minnesota counties. I'm advocating for a bolder approach. I'm proposing that this legislation funds each AMHI at the highest per capita rate, recognizing that while the service needs vary across the state, our entire state is struggling to deal with mental health crises and our mental health continuum has not been sufficiently funded to meet our community's needs. In close, I appreciate the conversations I've had with AMHI stakeholders to date and the work that has already been done. I ask us all to bring urgency to address the issues in this bill so that we achieve strong legislation that positions AMHI for the future. Now I'd like to turn it over to our testifiers and we'll look forward to your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Ryer. The first testifier we have is Linnea Mersch. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation uh, for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Hi, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you, Representative Ryer. My name is Linnea Mersch and I'm the Director of Public Health and Human Services for St. Louis County. I am here as a representative of the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, MAXA, and the Minnesota Inter-County Association, MICA and on behalf of our Region 3 AMHI. I'm here to testify in support of both this bill uh, with the amendments introduced and adopted and also HF 4584. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our perspective. So um, as shared by Representative Ryer, earlier this year, DHS released a proposed formula change to the Adult Mental Health Initiative grant the results of which would hurt residents in 32 of Minnesota's counties by reallocating $5.7 million from some regions to give to others. The department brought in an actuary team and had statewide representation to review new formula components with a goal of getting to a transparent, equitable distribution. That approach seemed to disregard the important history behind the base allocations. This isn't a math formula to be achieved through equal allocations as access, needs, and state services vary extensively across the state. The historical allocation base comprises previous state investments, like what our region has received through the Moose Lake Alternative Funds since the closure of the state hospital here. This needs to be taken into consideration with the work. Speaking directly from the region I represent, if the formula is implemented as drafted, we will lose approximately 25% of our mental health workforce in the county, in our community mental health centers. This will have impacts in psychiatry, nursing, community supports, jail diversion, crisis services, case management, and other areas. This will undoubtedly result in increased hospitalizations, hospital stays, public safety concerns, and devastating effects on individuals and families. It feels very absurd to have a formula discussion right now outside of the very conversation we are having in every sector at every level of government, government about unmet mental health needs, exacerbated with the pandemic and now workforce shortages. Counties do not support any reductions to the overall grants, nor to individual regions or county allocations with the grants. All 87 counties stand together in support of the premise 
that infrastructure grants should not take away from one to give to another. So HF 4588, as Representative Ryer said, does three things. It moves AMHIs from this historical pilot status to recognizing them as the core mental health infrastructure they are. Second, it ensures that when the new formula is rolled out in 2025, no county receives less than the amount the region received in 2022. Thank you for the caveat around the Moose Lake alternative funds that have been separate until now. And third, it includes this blank appropriation for additional funding in 2023. And again, those second two provisions are also in the proposed HF 4584. So in conclusion, counties do support the continued evolution of building out the state's mental health system. Many people across the state are yet unserved and lack access to basic services. Equity should be achieved through new long-term investments, which is what these bills seek to accomplish. Thank you for your time and I will be available for any questions. Thank you so much, Director Mersh. The second testifier we have, Angela Youngerberg. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Angela Youngerberg and I'm the Director of Business Operations for Blue Earth County Human Services. I'm here today as a representative of the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, known as MAXA, the Minnesota Inter-County Association, known as MICA, and also on behalf of our Regional Adult Mental Health Initiative uh, to testify in support of both House File 4588 and House File 4584. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My colleague, Linnea Mersh and I are here today because our mental health system has evolved and reform is needed. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, we're seeing levels of need for mental health services that we've not experienced before. In addition, the Department of Human Services has signaled that a significant change in funding distribution will be occurring in the coming years that will create winners and losers to the current funding levels. Based on conversations with many of you, it seems as though we have alignment that this is not the time to eliminate many mental health services in over 30 counties in the state of Minnesota. Rather, it's time to invest in the next evolution of our mental health services system. Uh, some historical context was provided earlier. I wanna provide a few additional um, points uh, regarding the history of AMHIs. In 1995 to 2002, when the initial funding was established, DHS had a vision for the mental health systemic reform. And so we're at another crux in the reform process. And that's what I encourage us to think about today. The vision was to promote deinstitutionalization of individuals from the state hospitals. And so limited funding was allocated to the regions where those individuals were likely to reside. And the state knew that a community-based infrastructure needed to be established. In some areas, the state invested money. And in some areas, the state immobilized staff from the state hospitals, similar to the region that I represent in South Central Minnesota. It's true that not each region received an equal share. There just simply was not enough resource to go around at the time, but the vision was to attach resource to the areas where the need um, was to be apparent at that present time. The plan was to continually invest in areas that did not receive funding in the beginning. And although some funding has come over the years, the um, plan to invest in that initial way of filling in the rest of the map in an equitable way has not uh, occurred in the way that it was meant to. The state investments in AMHI didn't address the inequities. And in fact, currently counties invest two times more of our local property tax dollars and revenue returns than the state does in these program areas. So when we talk about our adult mental health initiative um, and service system, we have to talk about both the base grants and the county investment, which is substantial. For the counties and the regions that stand to gain funding in the DHS proposed formula, it is desperately needed. It absolutely is needed. And in some areas of the state, maintaining a base workforce and mental health is nearly impossible. They have yet to build out their infrastructure and they have deserved the opportunity for many years. Counties see the current state as an opportunity to continue to advance the vision of mental health infrastructure from so many years ago, rather than come alongside a lacking vision of today. 
So the route forward that I am here to talk to you about today is to not support taking away from one AMHI to give to another. So we would like you to support sustainability, not trepidation in building systems, to provide county policy leaders time to work with the Department of Human Services as technical assistance on creating a formula that addresses both a mental health systemic vision that's focused on outcomes and not necessarily an equal dollar distribution. We want equity in outcomes. In the immediate, we'd like to focus on the lagging issues, access issues across the state. So we know that the AMHIs would need to increase our current services. Now this is just what's being provided by the AMHIs. We would need to in increase it by at least 22% um, of the state and county's combined resources to meet to demand for today's services, today's uh, uh, wait, wait lists for services, let alone think about what it would be to expand to additional proven services that are evidence-based in areas that don't even have them, which would take significantly more funding. So this is the next evolution of mental health systemic reform that we're talking about. I urge you to continue to hold counties and DHS to principles of reform, knowing that history, having a vision and focusing on outcomes even an outcome as basic as access to services. It's our mission to provide services to all Minnesotans and support for these bills will help us continue our mission to continue to fill in the gaps across the state. Thank you, and I will remain uh, available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Youngerberg. Any questions for the testifiers or the bill author or members? Representative Sandell. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, um, Representative uh, Ryer, I certainly support uh, the, the bill and um, uh, am pleased to uh, um, share the testimony today with all of which I agree with. <clears throat> My question is about um, finding providers. We've heard uh, in this committee and in education and others uh, the, the importance of mental health. Uh, last week, we heard a proposal uh, which was very ambitious that uh, would address uh, the mental health issues of just African Americans. Where, where is it and how soon are we going to be able to find those who can uh, provide the services you're all talking about? Thank you, Representative Sandell. Let's see, uh, Representative Ryer, do you want to take a stab and then we can go to testifiers? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Sandell. I will comment on it. Uh, I have not, of course, been involved in other legislation related to workforce related issues. However, we know that that is one of the major crises um, facing our state, from mental health to educators to other types of healthcare and more. Um, I do support uh, programs that are related to um, accelerating and funding education, like we saw with the CNAs uh, this, uh, that have been coming through, and also looking at options like loan forgiveness or um, looking at certification alternatives, especially for new Americans. Um, so I would just leave it at, I am open to those things, but this uh, bill is really about funding and making sure that when we have those people, we're able to uh, use them to provide the services people need. Thank you, Representative Breyer. Um, Deputy D D Director Mersh or uh, Ms. Youngerberg? Uh, sure, Chair Schultz, uh, Representative Sandel. I mean, I think it's a really important question and certainly one your committee is grappling with as we all are locally. I think first I would just point out that again, for a region like ours, this is a cut. So that has the impact of really um, having professionals questioning uh, the, the, the sustainability and the ongoing funding of work that they're really committed to, which is really a retention issue currently. Um, so that's where we currently are. I think uh, there have been all sorts of creative workforce initiatives introduced and we all will get to see the effectiveness and we're certainly exploring many as a region that has critical shortages for psychiatry, for um, licensed alcohol and drug treatment counselors already. And I do think there are also so many lessons learned from the pandemic period. We have so many new partners in our work 
um, because of our work together through all of this. Um, so many more partners that can provide peer level supports and services, and um, certainly an ability to expand telehealth in different ways to build on. So thank you. Thank you, Director Mersh. Ms. Youngerberg. I just want to uh, echo uh, Director Mersh's comments um, in that it, it's, it's the same um, scenario that we have here in Southern Minnesota is what, what she is talking about. Um, there is both the concept of maintaining and um, providing stability for, as well as increasing and growing. And so for an example, in our local mental health center, um, Blue Earth County runs a, a Rule 29 mental health center. And so we have a number of psychiatric providers, therapists, in order to, pro to provide a comprehensive array of services, we have multidisciplinary providers. Um, you all know of the, the nursing uh, shortage and we have RNs on staff who are working within our mental health center. And um, those RNs have shared with me that they have been approached with new job opportunities on, on a regular basis, sometimes at double the pay of what they're receiving now. And so we are looking at ways to continue to evolve our practices and evolve our, our business so that we can maintain nursing support in our mental health services. And, and, it, and the same goes across all areas of mental health. So the maintenance is one thing. Another thing that's really unique that our adult mental health initiative is doing, and there are other mental health initiatives that have been working on similar kinds of things, is that we have been partnering with um, uh, a local university on um, really bringing in workforce and encouraging um, new graduates and upcoming uh, students to uh, explore and learn about the field of mental health services. And so working um, on, on creating a center of excellence here locally is something that our adult mental health initiative is doing in addition to providing the services because we know that we need to continue in investing in providing opportunities for our upcoming workforce. And so really the other side of that too is taking our existing workforce and upskilling them. So trainings and additional pieces that we can continually try and provide. So as, as stated earlier, there's a number of strategies and the initiative, mental health initiatives have been engaged in this and are, are very well aware. Um, and, and this funding would help provide some additional opportunities to continue that work. Thank you, Ms. Youngerberg. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Rare, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, um, I did just a question for you. I, I also note that Representative Frederick is bringing forward a bill uh, under adult mental health initiatives. And, and Madam Chair, I appreciate your indulgence here. Um, I understand both bills have been promoted by MAXA and, and whatnot and, and, and have great virtue. I'm not in dispute on that, but I'm trying to understand that, and if you could articulate the difference between your bill and Representative Fredericks. And I will ask the same question of him as well, because I wanna to get to the root in terms of understanding why two bills that are similar, but yet have distinctive differences. And I, I hope that you will help me out in that regard. Representative Breyer. Thank you, could, We could also wait, and, and if you didn't wanna answer, we could hear Representative Fredericks' uh, bill and then discuss, but Representative Breyer, maybe a short response. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Albright. Um, the difference that I see uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, Representative Frederick's bill is focusing on the funding piece exclusively. Uh, my bill has a broader uh, approach with looking at the statutory structure and putting the an effort forward to be able to get it more institutionalized. Representative Albright. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, just, just a point of question, uh, not to be uh, contentious. I do note that there is a Senate companion for Representative Frederick's bill, but there is not one for you. And so just a question in terms of uh, with deadlines looming, uh, where does it stand in the Senate? We don't typically talk about this, but it is an important initiative 
and I appreciate that. So I, I just want to be clear in terms of where we stand in terms of moving this forward. Representative Breyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Albright. Uh, we're working on that. It, it's been moving fast and so uh, still getting that piece in place. Thank you, Representative Breyer. Any other questions from members? Okay, I want to thank Representative Breyer. Any closing comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the testifiers. Thanks to all the stakeholders who have been involved with this. Uh, Maxa, Micah, of course, and NDHS, who uh, I know is invested in the well-being of Minnesota. So I, I will just resume my call for urgency around this to work together and uh, sort out any last details so that we can um, have a strong EMHI system. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Raya. I also want to thank the testifiers for all the work they're doing in their county. So thank you so much. I know how hard you all work, um, and we really appreciate that. Okay, members, with that, I'm going to um, lay over House File 4588 as amended for possible inclusion in our human services omnibus bill. Okay, members, the next bill we have is House File 45. 84 and I don't see amendments. So my motion is to lay over House File 4584 for possible inclusion in our Human Services Omnibus Bill. Representative Frederick, can you please describe your bill? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As we've already kind of talked about that, this bill is simply narrower in scope uh, than Representative Breyer's bill. It really does kind of focus on the feedback that we received from the counties uh, in behavioral health and that the new funding formula that was put forward by DHS uh, while the intention is understood, uh, we don't necessarily want to take away from one county just to uh, fund another county. Because uh, we know that across the state, mental health services are not funded at the level that we need to because the demand, the need is much greater than what anywhere is providing. Uh, and so with the intent of trying to increase services, um, this bill would say that all of the different mental, adult mental health regions um, need to be funded at the same level that they have in the past, but instead of taking from one area to give to another, let's just provide additional funding to, to increase services uh, where appropriate. So uh, that's, that's really the, the nuts and bolts of it, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Frederick. Any questions? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Frederick, thank you for bringing this forward. Well, your bill, as uh, to your uh, point, is narrower in focus. Um, and, and as I understand from speaking with Representative Ryer on this subject, yours is focusing on the funding as opposed to hers is more of a strategic uh, a bill. Um, help me understand, um, are they complementary? Or does one supplant the other? And if uh, if the testifiers could speak to, uh, not a preference, but if there's any articulation of uh, differences that they might speak to in between the two bills, uh, if, if uh, the chair would indulge that uh, kind of cross-purpose uh, comparison, I'd appreciate it. Representative Frederick, and then we'll go to Director Mersh. Representative Frederick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that, uh, you know, everyone can bring different legislation to kind of address different issues. Uh, I think Representative Breyer's bill is a fantastic bill uh, and she's doing some good work there. Uh, this, my bill uh, personally was just a uh, response to uh, communication that I was hearing from my county uh, and the testimony that they provided uh, in behavioral health. And so I wanted to make sure that I was doing what I could uh, as a representative and represent my district to the best of my ability, which is what caused me to, to bring this specific piece forward. Thank you, Representative Frederick. Director Mersh, please proceed. Chair Schultz, thank you. Um, subdivision 11 and section two are identical in those two bills. And so it is really the will of um, committee and the realities of moving moving bills forward as to uh, what is possible. I also um, certainly wouldn't speak for DHS and I, I know they're available here, but um, it has been referenced that the department would seek to adjust the language uh, in a future session 
um, acknowledging that AMHIs are not pilot programs. And so um, I, I do know that is on their radar um, as well. And so certainly um, 4588 as amended today does make three additional changes um, that counties are in full support of. Um, and again, I, I would defer to the department as to the timeline they were considering moving some of those other items forward. Thank you, Director Mersh. Representative Albright. You're muted. You probably like that from time to time. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to pick sides, but I do think that particularly with two bills that are very similar, I, I think it would be appreciable uh, to have a DHS weigh in. There, there seems to be some contention uh, from MAXA in terms of the ongoings with the, uh, the AMHIs. I, I would certainly uh, think it would be um, beneficial to hear uh, the other side of the coin. Representative Albright, we have Ms. Graham here. It's good to see you again. Please state your name and affiliation and then proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for the question, Representative Albright. Um, appreciate all of the, the focus on AMHI um, in this hearing. I think in terms of the um, Representative Ryer's bill, um, first of all, I just want to clarify, there is no formula right now for AMHI. So I think there's been um, a few statements that, you know, DHS is creating a new formula. Um, and I just want to be clear that there is no equitable formula. Um, and, and the proposal that we have, um, which was, you know, set to be implemented sometime around fiscal year, our calendar year 2025, I believe, um, is not just um, equal amounts of money to each region. There was a lot of thought that went into um, the, the regional specific needs. Um, and we can talk more about that in this committee if, if that's of interest. I know we had a pretty extensive overview in the Behavioral Health Committee of how that formula that we're proposing actually came together. I would say with House File 4588 and the um, policy changes, we do have some pretty, um, pretty significant construction and technical issues to work through with stakeholders. Um, the department did not bring forward legislation to um, adjust the policy language this session as part of our commitment to the AMHI work group that we wouldn't be doing that this session. So we really um, want to sit down with stakeholders and continue those conversations. Um, there's some pretty significant omissions from this language. There's not um, recognition that tribal AMHIs exist. There's some I think we could be a little bit more robust when we're talking about um, how AMHI should address um, racial and ethnic disparities in regions. Um, there's a, a whole host of issues with the language that I won't go um, too deep into today, but um, we do have some concerns about moving this forward um, this session. Um, we would like to continue to work with the AMHI work group as we've committed to do and work on this language and make sure that it works for everyone and that um, you know, we're taking into account all of the voices. We haven't had all of the voices at the table to actually vet this particular language. In terms of the increase in funding, that's something we would certainly welcome um, if that's something that the legislature is committed to um, investing in long term. Um, we, you know, our, our commitment um, with the formula is just to make sure that we have something in place so that these funds are more um, stable and that they're not prone to you know, the legislature coming in cut and cutting the funds, given that there isn't any kind of formula or rhyme or reason to how they're spent right now. Um, so that's sort of our position at this point. We're happy to talk more offline with, with legislators and stakeholders. Thank you, Ms. Graham. I know that the agency did have a lot of meetings with stakeholders about the formula and that it's um, just an um, idea right now. And there is a report, Representative Albright. So read that report and um, you and I should talk offline after you uh, read through that report. And then um, possibly if we have time in committee, we can have an overview of that report in the formula. Representative Albright, one more question and then we need to move on. No, <clears throat> no more questions. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important topic, uh, particularly in light of uh, the testimony uh, from the various counties perspective. Um, oftentimes uh, the legislature is, uh, sending uh, directives forward, forth and the counties are, are kind of just an administrative role 
uh, certainly appreciate uh, and, and and would reinforce the notion that counties uh, need to be at the table because they are the uh, adjudicator for all these programs. So uh, I'm hopeful that that uh, message is being heard loud and clear from all the stakeholders, particularly DHS. Um, and uh, look forward to conference committee in, in looking both these bills. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Albright. And I'll just add, I've been working very closely with, the, with my county and they're in communications with the other counties. I've been doing this all session and um, at a time when we have an unbelievable increased demand for behavioral health services, uh, it's my intention, I do not wanna cut any funding to uh, behavioral health. I think we need to invest in behavioral health and invest in um, our people to make sure that they can thrive. So I think we agree, Representative Albright, and um, hopefully we can do that this session. Okay, uh, Representative Frederick, to any final closing comments on your bill? I, I appreciate the discussion and I uh, hope to have the committee support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So with that, members, House File 4584 is laid over for possible inclusion in our human services omnibus bill. The next bill we have is House File 1432. Um, we heard this bill along with the amendment earlier in session, but it was not in our possession. So we're taking it up now to amend the bill. Would you like to move the A2 amendment, Representative Frederick? So move, Madam Chair. Okay, Representative Frederick moves the A2 amendment. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the A2 amendment, the motion prevails and the A2 amendment is adopted. Can you describe um, the bill as amended, Representative Frederick? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I know that we've uh, heard this bill a lot, so I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, it updates the Vulnerable Adult Act, which was uh, implemented over 40 years ago. Uh, including definitions of neglect, including self-neglect. As we've seen that that has uh, been increasingly a thing uh, as people have come through the pandemic in the last few years. And so this is uh, just supporting counties uh, with lots and lots of lots of stakeholder feedback incorporated into it. Um, and if people have questions, I'm happy to dive into it, but in the interest of the time, I'll just be brief. Any questions, members? We do have DHS available. Not seeing any. Thank you, Representative Frederick. So House File 1432 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion in human services omnibus bill. Thank you, Representative Frederick. The last item on our agenda is House File 3852. We also heard this bill earlier in session informationally and now we're taking it up officially. So Representative Knorr, I see that you have an A1 amendment. Um, Yes, Madam Chair. Can you describe uh, that amendment, please, and then we'll vote on it. Uh, Madam Chair, the A1 amendment is just a technical changes uh, to the bill, and I would like to ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Norris. It's a technical change. This is going to be a voice vote, members. Oh, Representative Albright. I, not to be a stickler, uh, but sometimes technical changes do change the ramifications of a bill dramatically. Uh, so if Representative Norris would just... Uh, be succinct in terms of the elaboration, in terms of what technical changes are being. Sure, Representative Noor. Uh, just to cover some of the uh, technical changes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, it's for example, uh, it before working on line 33, we're inserting multidisciplinary. Uh, page two, line 14, we're deleting mental health. Uh, page two, line five, we're deleting program and inserting project. Uh, page two, line three, we're deleting allocation and inserting adult protection grant allocation, and also making a minor change uh, to page one, line 11. Uh, that's why I said it's a technical change, uh, not necessarily changing the underlying bill. Thank you, Representative Noor. All those in favor of adopting the A1 Amendment to House File 3852, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the A1 amendment is adopted. Are there any questions, members, from, for the underlying bill as amended? We do have um, Amanda Vickstrom with Elder Justice and Sean Burke for, available for questions. I'm not seeing any. Representative Noor, final comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As we have uh, discussed this bill, uh, it's really important that we provide uh, resources to the adult protective services. As we are aware of, we are not 
fully funding and if this falls to the counties, this will help us address the, the gap in funding. And uh, it's, it's a good bill. We need to take care of those who are most vulnerable. As you all are aware of, Minnesota only accepts 24% of eligible cases compared to the uh, national average, which is higher than that. Uh, particularly when it comes to BIPOC individuals, individuals with mental health issues or substance use disorder. So uh, Madam Chair and members, this is a critical bill that addresses a significant gap in our system. Uh, it's time for us to invest and provide the resources to make sure that individuals who are vulnerable or, or older adults are protected in our state. So I ask for your support. Thank you. Representative Noor. So members, my motion is to lay over House File 3852 as amended for possible inclusion in our human services omnibus bill. Okay, members. Well, great job today. I'm going to let you out early. Representative Albright. Thank maybe you, not. Chair. No, uh, just, just a, 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 I guess, a procedural scheduling uh, notification. I know that we're coming up on second deadline uh, very shortly. Um, I'm sure it's your intention to be rolling out uh, some a form of omnibus bill. Uh, we passed the vehicle earlier uh, this week. Just wondering if you could provide uh, us with some details. I also know that there was kind of a, a stake uh, held out for a possible a meeting on Friday uh, for bills. I don't see anything scheduled yet. So I'm wondering if you could uh, elaborate for the benefit of the members of the committee what, uh, what the schedule might look like for this, say, the next uh, 10 days. Thank you, Representative Albright. And you anticipated what I was about to say before your hand shot up. So members, we have a full day tomorrow. So we are hearing five bills. Some of those are division reports. And um, we will be, let's see, let me look at the list quickly. Sorry, give me a sec. We were going to be laying over all of those bills, just so you know. Um, and one of those bills is going to be the governor's supplemental budget. So I encourage you to read over that bill before committee. And the other one, we're going to take more time on House File 4447, the workforce bill. So that is tomorrow. Um, Friday, we do not have anything scheduled yet, but I want to just keep that on your calendar in case bills come to us at the last minute. So just keep checking your email. If we don't have any bills, there's no need to meet, but just keep it on your calendar. And then we are very busy staff and the HHS team on putting together an omnibus bill um, that is not yet final. Um, I will call you uh, later, Representative Albright, to give you more information on that. Um, and then we will bring that forward um, hopefully soon. So that is gonna be, it's gonna be a busy week next week um, pouring over that bill. Any other questions from members? Madam Chair, do you have an, an estimate in terms of, I know that there are a number of other committees meeting on Friday, um, and I, I will extend uh, grace uh, based upon what's going on, but at some point, um, logic will release yep, people. By, I would say by Thursday at late a.m., we will, we will we'll verify if we need that Friday meeting. I think that will hopefully give members time if they want to drive back to their districts. I'd appreciate uh, that. I always appreciate that too, Representative Albright. So members, um, so just to keep checking your email and we'll notify you by Thursday late morning of our Friday meeting. And um, I know we have floor session today at 12, so hopefully I'll see some of you at the state capitol. With that, everybody have a great rest of your day and uh, hopefully see you later and we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.